This episode may contain content of a graphic nature. Listener discretion is advised. Thanks for joining us today on another episode of Body to Burial. I'm Mariah. And I'm Nikki. We're just two regular true crime junkies who decided it was time to see crime from a new perspective. This is Body to Burial. I am really excited about the lady that we're talking to today. Her name is Dr. Joni Johnston, and she is a forensic psychologist. Really? Yeah. So like in my head, because I know you watch Mindhunter, I feel like she's like Holden's character. Okay. That's what I think. I could be way off base, but I feel like she's the person that's like, okay, tell me why you ate the Barbie heads. How does that make you feel? Why do you do that? You know, I, I, I feel like she's getting to the like, why? And like, maybe she, like what their past trauma is like, why'd your mom screw you up so bad? Because it's always like the moms in those shows. Yeah. Yeah. That you became a like massive murderer. Uh-huh. Ooh. Okay. Here's Joni. She's popping in. Hold on. Okay. Joni? Nikki, can you hear me? Yeah. Joni, are you there? Can you hear us? Joni, if you can hear us, we can't hear you. She's having microphone issues. She's troubleshooting. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Problem solving. <laughs> you did it. Oh, my Lord. It's always something. I mean, technology, man, it's supposed to be easier, but sometimes I swear it's just so complicated. Well, yeah. we're glad oh. that you're with us and you found a way in. Yes, me too. Well, I mean, yeah, we were just kind of, you know, spitballing and talking about, you know, what we think you do. Um, so I guess a good way to a good way to start would be how would you describe your job in one to two sentences? I am a forensic psychologist, private investigator, and crime writer. Okay. Like you're you're a woman of many, many hats. I do have to say that I like wearing a lot of different hats and luckily they all kind of fit together. Yeah. In different ways. Yeah. So it's a Forensic psychologist, the same as like a criminal profiler, are those kind of terms that are interchangeable? They're not interchangeable, although they often are confused with each other. So a forensic psychologist is basically a psychologist who works to help answer legal questions. So anywhere okay. you have a legal question and there, there's some question about the violence risk or somebody's mental state or those kinds of things, you will often find a psychologist involved. And that's what I do. Yeah, because I was thinking it was like that show, Mindhunter, where it's like you you try to crack down why they the crime happened or who they are and all that stuff, you know, by their mind, I guess, is what I was thinking. And I think a lot of people, when they think about forensic psychology, they think about John Douglas, you know, the behavioral analysis unit or the FBI. Yeah. And there are very, very, very select few people who actually do that part of it. Although I think that there is becoming a lot more collaboration among different professionals and different groups. And I think that's very exciting. So, for example, when you're talking about law enforcement and they have a death that they're not sure if it is, for example, a suicide or an accident or a homicide, I think there is more collaboration with a forensic psychologists who do psychological autopsies which kind of come in and basically do, when we think about a physical autopsy is taking apart a body to uh-huh. see what causes death. And a psychological autopsy is kind of the mental equivalent of that, kind of coming in and recreating that person's life and particularly their last days to see if we can help to answer that question. So I think you're seeing definitely more multidisciplinary teams working together, but it's very rarely like you were talking about, well, my hunter, where somebody comes in and a psychologist walks around the crime scene and says, aha, you know, this person, <laughs> this offender is 25, you know, yeah. this, um, this race, this has this job and those kind of things. I, I, you know, there's some research that, it does help narrow down a suspect pool if there's a group. So we've done some research, for example, on serial offenders that can, I think, actually do some behavioral analysis. But again, I think that's a, a relatively select few. So explain to me, like, what exactly, like, where do you come in and what are you doing? 
Yeah, there's, there's so many different hats that I wear or that I can wear and that a forensic psychologist can wear, which is one of the most wonderful and exciting parts of what I do. So that that question might include, I actually got a call this morning from a guy who, a criminal defense attorney whose client had been arrested, and he is wondering if his client is um, should consider an insanity plea. Okay. And so I might be called in to evaluate him, look at all the witness statements, the police records, his records, his mental health history, et cetera, and make some kind of form some kind of opinion as to whether this person was legally insane at the time that this crime was committed. So that's one hat that I wear. And how are you determining that? Sorry to interrupt you. Is it like a questionnaire, like a therapist where you're asking them questions and based on their responses, you're figuring out if you are going to agree or disagree, like how, how does that process work? Yeah, it is that, but it's a lot more than that. Because as you can imagine, when somebody is um, in a legal proceeding, they have all kinds of interests. And so mm-hmm. one of the big differences between a forensic psychologist and a clinical psychologist is that we don't just rely on what that person says, okay. because there's all different motivations involved. And I, I have no judgment here. I understand that, you know, when your life is on the sure. line or your freedom is on the line. So um, that would involve, for example, going in, talking to the um, defendant, doing some psychological testing on the defendant. That would include personality testing, uh, testing about mental illnesses. It would include some testing about whether the person could be exaggerating or minimizing, you know, what happened. It would also, though, involve getting a bunch of their records, what was their mental health history before um, okay. the alleged crime was committed because, you know, as we all know, pop up once you've committed a crime. So if somebody okay. is legally insane, you would expect her to have some criminal, some um, psychological history. It also involves, of course, looking at all the different statements that were taken and were made at the time that this offense occurred. So what did the police officer see? You know, when that when they arrested that person, what did the witnesses yeah. see who were there? What did the victim say? So it's it's a pretty um, complex evaluation because not only are we looking at a bunch of different sources, but we're trying to li- literally recreate somebody's mental state in the past, and that's a yeah. challenge. So if, for example, somebody was psychotic. They may have been in jail now for several months. They may be on psychotropic medication. And when I talk to that person, they seem perfectly fine because they're stable on medication mm. now. Yeah, they've been leveled out. Exactly. And then I go back and I look and I'm like, wow. I mean, look at all these statements that were made. Look at this person's history. They have a history of psychosis. They were in, you know, several hospitals for A, B, and C. So it is looking at the big picture, not just what the person's saying, what they've done, what other people observed, what psychological testing suggests, and then forming an, an opinion about that. Are some people, because when they're yeah. trying to say that they didn't, you know, that they're crazy or whatever, but, and then, but some people like, can they be, I, I don't want to, how do I even know how to say the word, but like, like where they're like a psychopath where like they're telling you what you want to hear and like knowing how to answer the stuff correctly. Like, is that, how do you break that down? Well, that's a really good question. And and let me just tell you that, you know, you know, nobody is foolproof. I Mm -hmm. mean, you know, we can, we can all be fooled, right. Um, Given upon the, given the right circumstances. But one of the things I do, for example, is when I'm evaluating somebody is I'm not only looking at all the other statements, but I'm talking to the custody officers who are with this person. I'm talking to any mental health professionals that they're seeing because it's really easy to pretend to be a certain way Mm -hmm. for a few hours. Yeah. Um, You know, I think anybody can, can pretend for a few hours. It's really difficult though, to pretend to be, um, you know, legally insane, which of course is a legal opinion, not a mental illness. Yeah. Um, You know, consistently 24 hours a day yeah and, and certainly for years before that yeah right? which is what you often see when somebody has a, a viable um, insanity plea oftentimes this person has an extensive psychiatric history you know they may have been in and out of psychiatric hospitals they may have been diagnosed with a severe mental illness so you're looking for all those things and that goes into your determination yeah it just doesn't happen overnight 
like no. all of a sudden. No, it, I, it reminds me of like when you first start dating somebody that like the first three months, you don't know they're a psycho yet until you like, you know, you're with them a little bit longer. Well, yeah, they settle. They start to let the walls down a little bit. Yeah. They get comfortable. Yeah. So Absolutely. Sounds- and, and that's a very, you know, it's a very good point because I don't just see that person one time either. You know, which is a very, very good point. So in addition to looking at all the other things that people are saying and how this person's functioning inside of jail and their history and everything, I'm also seeing them over a little bit of time. So it also makes gives me a little bit of a better perspective in there. I can give you a quick example um, of yeah. a case I had that might be interesting. I mean, it kind of illustrates, you know, an, an example, because I think there really is, there are a lot of myths about the insanity plea. One of them is it's kind of a get out of jail free card. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, um, and I can tell you, it really is not that it's a very, very, very difficult defense. Um, number one, because it's much narrower than a mental illness. So just because somebody has a severe mental illness does not mean they're legally insane. It's much, much narrower. So here's an example though, of a case I had several years ago. Um, it was really really kind of a sad case and all the way around, although it had a rel- relatively happy ending. But there was a, a young man who, this was shortly after 9-11. I don't know how old the two of you are, but if you remember 9-11. Yeah. Um, yeah. And just how that just changed everything overnight for mm-hmm. so many people. And it was shortly after that, that this uh, young man was driving his car in San Diego and he had been hearing voices, which his family was kind of aware of. He had a history of bipolar disorder and he was having some side effects of medication. So he under medicating at best, not medicating himself at worst. Mm-hmm. Um, that was not clear. He was driving down the road and he looked beside him and there was a car driving down the road with a man and a woman in there. And he heard this voice telling him that this person and driving the car beside him was a terrorist. Mm-hmm. And this terrorist was on the way to the San Diego airport to blow it up. Ooh. And so this person who was a pretty, in, in an interesting way, and a very heroic person, thought what? So he's calling 911, but he is also concerned that nothing's going to happen um, in time. And so he literally run, runs this guy off the road um, and then rams his car into this car. Oh. So this car can no longer function. And luckily, um, that was the extent of it. The people kind of stopped and the police got there. and. It is poor, obviously the poor victim in the car who has the only thing he's done is drive down the road, you know, right. going yeah. somewhere on the five. <laughs> um, and yeah, and so, um, it, you know, as it turns out, so of course this person's arrested. He is initially charged with, I think, attempted murder or wow. something like that. And his attorney contacted me and I was able to go and evaluate him. And then, of course, look, and he also, of course, when he, um, you know, he didn't try to get away. As a matter of fact, he is, the last thing he wants to do is get away. He's trying to block this person from driving off. So everything that he's doing, really before and after that, is consistent with this belief, right? That he is, protecting, in fact, yeah. protecting, and, exactly, and keeping people from dying, essentially. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so when the, when the police get there, he is telling them, you know, you've got to arrest these people, they're terrorists. Um, you know, I know that I ran off the road, but it was the only thing I could do to keep them from, you know, hurting other people, et cetera, et cetera. Now, this was obviously a, a relatively, I don't want to say an easy case, but there was just a lot of evidence to support the fact that this person, he had a mental health history, he had a history of psychosis, he had a, uh, you know, a diagnosis of bipolar disorder. I mean, everything pretty much lined up um, to support the fact that he did not appreciate that what he was doing was wrong. And that's kind of one of the prongs of insanity plea. It's not, the definition is not, do you have a severe mental illness? It does your severe mental illness in the situation prevent you from, you know, from understanding or appreciating that what you're doing is wrong. And Mm. as you can see in this case, he literally believed that he was saving people. Yeah. So there's an example of, you know, of a case where this person, uh, and it was interesting because, and this is actually true in the majority of cases, there was no big debate. The prosecutor also agreed, you know, that this person, um, you know, was was legally insane at the time of the crime, and they worked out an arrangement. I think they reduced his charge, and he spent his time in a forensic psychiatric hospital. So that's where you would go instead of a, uh, into jail, like w- with everyone else or prison. 
or whatever. You go into a, um, like a psychiatric ward if you are yeah. deemed. Yeah. Okay. If you are found not guilty. Yeah. I mean, that's a very, very important. Another very important point. You know, it's not like you're kind of like, okay, well, do you sorry this happened? You know, have a good life. I yeah. mean, you are committed to a psychiatric hospital until you are deemed, you know, safe in the community. Yeah. And there's some, there's some pretty interesting statistics that oftentimes, again, depending upon what the offense is, people can end up spending more time in a forensic you know, hospital than they might have if they had served out their sentence. Yeah, exactly. So it's, it, it's a little bit more complicated. Yeah. Cause I always, a lot of people think. I pictured it like where, you know, when people try to do the insanity plea where like all of a sudden they're, you know, make acting crazy in their cell and like going to the bathroom and smeared it on. Like, that's what I pictured. Like, and that's probably from movies, you know, like that I get that image from like why you're, why people try to do the insanity plea after they commit a crime just so that they can, they think they get less, less time. But yeah, you, it seems like you have to like really evaluate their mental state before, during, and even after to even get that. You really, you really do. Um, there was a, um, a serial killer, Kim Bianchi, who was one of the Hillside Stranglers who tried to claim um, insanity after his murders. Mm. and. Um, he, he claimed that he had multiple personality disorder. And, you know, it, this is a kind of a story where it shows that, A, yes, people can be fooled, yeah. <laughs> including mental health professionals. And yeah. B, luckily, not all can be fooled. Um, <laughs> because he had really managed to convince a, a number of mental health professionals that he had multiple personality disorder. And then even though his name was Kenneth, I think it's Steve was the name of his alter, who had committed these crimes. and. Uh, luckily, I think an, uh, a psychiatrist came in and started talking to him and eventually said something along the effects. It was, was very, very skeptical because this person had no psychiatric history, no history of dissociation. I mean, it was almost like his, you know, his personality disorder appeared mm -hmm. after he committed his crime yeah. conveniently. Yeah. But, <laughs> and, um, and he, um, you know, I think, mentioned to Kenneth Bianchi that, um, you know, I've never really heard of a case where there was only two authors. I mean, every person with multiple personality disorder, which of course now we call by a different name, but that was the, the term that was used at the time, they all have at least three or more. And this was completely not true. But uh, so the next time he visited uh, Mr. Bianchi, lo and behold, a third altar appeared <laughs> kind of magically. So, yeah. <laughs> you know, that was kind of a... Yeah, kind I of a, um, yeah, yeah, that didn't really work well out for Mr. Bianchi, and he eventually did um, acknowledge that he had made this up as an attempt to, you know, to plead insane. So, yeah, I mean, people can be fooled, but I do think it is more complicated than, you know, just kind of saying, hey, what's going on? Or if I act crazy, quote crazy, you know, in the jail. Yeah. That's going to convince people. But do you have, do you see criminals? Um, like, I would assume, like, because there are some like serial killers or even just criminals that are very, very, very smart, you know, like, like very smart. And they research like psychology and all these different crazy stuff. And can you like with your job, can you, like, I guess with that case, that sort of case too, you can break down and finally see that maybe they're pathological liars or they just are really good and re like really good at pretending or really good at like they think they know what they're talking about or that they're you know the things to say to you is that a common thing or is that more like only the worst of the worst has that ability like IQ wise to fool a bunch of people well I think it goes back again to the fact that we're looking at data points throughout time and mm -hmm. not just you know, how good can the person kind of fake it once they're behind bars? So when you think about it, if you are really going to try to plead and saying, which is, a, again, a very tough road to hoe, because mm -hmm. for one thing, juror, jurors are extremely skeptical mm. about insan insanity pleas. It is yeah. not a popular defense, and it's not a very easy one. Um, and as a matter of fact, it's funny, there's some research that shows that statistically, um, Serial killers are more likely to attempt the insanity plea. Um, and I think a lot of times that's just because if you are not legitimately legally insane, mm -hmm. then it's almost like a it's almost like a Hail Mary. 
Yeah. Right? In other words, the, ev- the evidence is so overwhelmingly against you um, that to plead not guilty is just kind of fruitless. And so it becomes, okay, this is kind of my only path. Yeah. Um, th- there's some evidence that there have literally been cases where there was a pretty good case that this person might have been legally insane, and yet jurors are so incensed by the you know the, the actual acts um, and the crime that there have been interviews with jurors who said, "Yeah, I thought the guy was really you know kind of off the rocker and didn't know what he was doing, but I didn't care." Mm-hmm. You know, it was like, yeah. I want to make sure this person never gets out. Yeah, um, there. Yeah, like I was thinking about like. Um women who snap and kill their kids like that to me I feel would be like it'd be really hard to be like like I read a case a a long time ago and I don't even remember who the lady's name was but she had cut open her infant's stomach because she thought that there were snakes in there I think he had colic Mm -hmm. and she thought that would alleviate it um so it's like Mm -hmm. obviously that lady has some severe mental illness but I feel like if I was sitting on the jury stand I would not be able to get past the fact that like you brutally murdered a child because you thought that there were snakes in there so I guess I get what you're saying like it's hard to look past the act and separate that the person is actually mentally sick you know it it, it is I think I mean when you look at um, cases of postpartum psychosis, like I, I'm sure you're familiar with the Andrea Yates case, the yeah. woman who drowned her five kids. Oh yeah, yeah. Just because that was, yeah. that was such a, fam- a famous case. Um, you know, that was an interesting case because initially she was found guilty, um, even though there was overwhelming evidence that she had had multiple episodes of postpartum psychosis. Mm-hmm. That she, had, you know, her doctor had said you cannot have more children. Talk, you know, talked to her husband about that. Um, you know, I mean, there's all kinds of facts in that case. Um, and even with that, you know, she was initially found guilty. I mean, her case got overturned because of a an error in, in expert witness testimony. Um, and then the jury found that she was not guilty by reason of sanity. And kind of interestingly, up with that case, I read an article, I think it was last week, that she has been, I think, found to be legally sane at this point, and she has declined relief. Wow. Oh, really? A couple of years. Mm-hmm. I didn't even know so, that they could do like, that. I didn't know they could opt not to be released. You know, it's funny you say that because, I mean, I guess I thought it was a possibility, but I've never actually read of anybody doing that. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. apparently, you know, I, I, apparently you can, at least in Texas. Wow. So if you get, if you say she, because she got the insanity please she was able to go to a facility and for the crimes that she would have had, like life in prison, I would assume if she didn't have that, but she does have the ability to, if they deem her better, like they did, they, they could have let her out if she wanted to. Yeah. Because when you think about like, I mean, it just gets to be so complicated because when you think about the philo- you know, the philosophy behind that, in other words, if we are going to have an insanity plea, if our justice system says that people can only be held criminally liable for things that they are aware of. You know what I mean? That they, that they know that they're doing is wrong, mm-hmm. that there's no, there, there's no mitigating circumstance. In other words, you know, I mean, the, the, the courts have said, for example, if, if somebody joins a cult and that cult engages in criminal, criminal activity, they've pretty much said that it's on you, right? Mm-hmm. Because you have, a cho- you have a choice about joining this group. And so if this group does these crimes, we're going to hold you accountable. On the other hand, I think the courts and our criminal justice system has said, if you have a severe mental illness that is to the level that it impairs your ability to appreciate and understand that what you're doing is wrong, we recognize that isn't a choice that you have, right? In other words, that that is an illness that you have. And so we as a society, and we can agree or not agree with it, we as a society are saying under those circumstances, we are not going to hold you criminally liable because you are ill. You know what I mean? This is something you could not control. Yeah. So there, the therefore, if that is the thinking, if you go into a forensic hospital and you get well or you get better, then you are no longer punished, mm-hmm. right? This isn't a punishment. It becomes a treatment. When you go into a forensic hospital, okay. Even though, 
You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's not a, it's, your punishment isn't to be sent to a forensic yeah. hospital. I mean, it, it may feel like that, but your 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 treatment, it, because we are not finding you criminally responsible, we want you to get better at some point. See, my now, understanding, you can imagine it, yeah, I thought it was different. I thought it was like a, um, a punishment, but it was just a little more not as scary as prison, <laughs> you know, like that's, that's what I thought. I thought like, oh, it's just like a, a better place to go than to prison. But I thought they still had to do their whole term. No, they don't. Now, some states don't like that. And so they have passed um, a law where you could be found guilty, but mentally ill. Okay. And so if you are found guilty, but mentally ill, you go to prison but you are provided a certain amount of mental health services. Okay. So you you still serve your sentence, but you are guaranteed a certain amount of mental health services. Um, some states have that and some states don't. But that's a different, that's kind of what you're talking about in a way. Yeah, right? that's Where, what I thought it was like. Yeah. Yeah. and But that's not um, not guilty by reason of insanity. Oh, Again, okay. the not guilty part means you're not responsible for what happened. Got it. But But... We are still going to make sure that you're safe to the community. We're not just going to let you go. Yeah. Right? We're going to make sure that this doesn't happen again. Yeah. By making sure that you get the treatment that you need. Interesting. Yeah, I had no clue. I thought it was completely opposite. I thought it was just they did that because it's like the the club med of punishments or something. You know, like uh-huh. I didn't I didn't think it would be that. You know, how you just described it. That's interesting, Tony. I guess. My question for you is, what do you think triggers these people to have episodes like this? Like I'm thinking of, and Nikki, Nikki's in California too. Um, I think it was like maybe two years ago, the father, they like ran a surf camp. I think they lived in Carlsbad or somewhere. And he took his little Mm -hmm. kids over to Mexico and killed them. Um, What? Don't you remember that, that, Nikki? Um, No. Yeah. Yeah. it It was really horrific and sad they were just like this poster Mm. american family and he told his wife he was taking the kids out for the day and then ended up killing them because they had like evil spirits or something in them or something like that so it's like how does a normal person that has functioned completely normal for the last 30 years like, is there something gradually that has been happening that maybe she never noticed like i just i guess i wonder like Or did he literally wake up that day and something changed in his, like, how does that happen? Yeah, I'm familiar with the case to the extent that I know exactly who you're talking about. And I know he had two little ones, a little boy and a little girl. They were very, very young. Um, I I know the case that you're talking about. And I know that he had kind of gotten involved in, um, I think it was Chewing On um, online and got very immersed in that group um, and began developing initially kind of these extreme beliefs but it does sound like at some point they almost transition right into mm-hmm. these delusions you know to believe that your children have some kind of i think it was like a snake yes something, something, something I can't remember yeah, all the a creature details or, or something yeah and yeah and that you know the, the, when they grew up there was going to be these demons basically or these horrible beings mm-hmm. or whatever and he had to kind of get rid of them yeah. so i don't know his particular case um but when you look at individuals who develop you know kind of a severe mental illness or delusion a lot of times there is kind of a, a, a gradual development and so family members it's kind of odd in a way like they start noticing sometimes that things are different and the person's becoming, they're expressing more and more kind of extreme beliefs, but it's gradual. And so sometimes they don't, they don't, aren't aware of the danger involved. You know, you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Because they're hearing this person yeah. get involved in this and they're doing this and they're doing this. And then, um, and the person is becoming increasingly delusional. And, you know, one of the things that is important when we talk about delusional beliefs is that it's not based on reality. And so sometimes people think, well, I'm just going to talk this person out of it. Or if I provide the facts, they're going to see that this is not yeah. real or this can't be true. But they're not rooted. And they're not rooted in reality. Exactly. It would be like you and I standing somewhere and you and I looking out at the ocean and, you know, and you said, look at that pretty sailboat and, and you're out there. And I'm going, there's not a sailboat. There's no sailboat out there. What are you talking about? 
you are seeing that sailboat, right? Nothing yeah. is going to convince you probably that you don't see that sailboat because you see it. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I can see, see it. it. I don't know why you don't exactly. see it. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Well, you know, when I first went into um, my first internship, this is so naive, but I was I was very, very young. It's my first internship. I worked in the state hospital, and there was a really, oh, such a bad case of a 15-year-old boy who was developing schizophrenia. Mm-hmm. And um, oh. I guess he had had his first, really, his first psychotic break, and he had all kinds of, he was hearing all kinds of voices, and he believed that the television was talking to him and just taunting him and, you know, calling him names. and. I literally did think, you know, I must have been like 21 and I, you know, I sat and watched TV with him and I don't hear anything, you know, and he <laughs> like somehow that was going to convince him you know, that you know, yeah. he's going to see the light, you know, and he's talking and everything. And it was just, it was my first, I mean, I think I knew that, but I was, I mean, I wasn't even graduate school then, but, um, but I just thought I really did think if I just presented reality, if there were like five of us sitting there. And we're all saying, no, there's nothing, there's nothing coming through there. Yeah. And of, of course, his response was, you know, I don't know what, maybe they can only communicate with me. Right. Then you start to uh, rationalize why you see it, right? Like, oh, well, you can't see exactly. it because your eyesight's not good. That's why you don't, like, the boat's too exactly. far out for exactly. you to notice it. Like, you start explaining away why other people can't. Exactly. Can't drug use and alcohol use and stuff like that do the same kind of thing? to to the brain it, it definitely can um and you know one of the things i used to say i worked um and i think i maybe i mentioned i'm not sure but i worked in the maximum security prison for a couple of years and i used to used to say that meth, i think methamphetamine is the devil you know, just yeah i saw you know so many people come in with kind of a methamphetamine induced psychosis and then when they would kind of get sober you know or kind of get off the medication uh, I mean, off the drugs, then that, those symptoms would go away. So there's no question that some drugs can cause um, psychosis. Now, from a legal standpoint, you don't really have much to hang on to. Mm. So if you are doing a ton of math and you become extremely paranoid and you attack somebody because you think that person is plotting against you or going to hurt you or whatever, for the most part, the courts say, again, is it voluntary or not voluntary? The courts say what? You chose yeah. to ingest that drug. No, no, you didn't think this was going to happen to you. You didn't think you were going to have these symptoms or whatever, but you shouldn't have been doing that drug. And so therefore, you're going to be liable criminally. Do their brains, when they, like, so they get sober, do they, do their brains go back to normal or is there lasting effects with that? Well, it depends. I mean, I have seen, and it's super scary because for the most part, when people, if they have a, like an amphetamine induced psychosis, for the most part, as, they're, as the drug wears off, the symptoms go away. Mm-hmm. But I have definitely seen uh, people who were chronically using methamphetamine. And over a period of time, um, they develop what we call kind of a substance induced psychosis, mm-hmm. where even when they came off the medication, they were still having those symptoms. I have seen people who have done it done meth for example there may be other drugs but that's one i'm most familiar with in terms of the long-term effects yeah. been doing it for so long that it literally does turn into mental illness and yeah. their symptoms persist even if they're not using drugs and that becomes a whole nother challenge you know in terms of treatment yeah and do you see like um like children are children ever like where they've committed a crime and and they are deemed you know mentally ill does that happen or children are a whole different ball game well you know most children obviously are dealt with in the juvenile justice system um and so i don't work directly with the juvenile justice system but one of the things i do that's really interesting i think and so challenging is um you know california a couple of years ago passed a law that if um if somebody received life without parole and they did their, they committed their crime as a juvenile then they are um, they are able now to be reevaluated to see if at some point they should be offered a chance of parole. And so, what is so interesting and so challenging is, you know, I see people now who are in their forties, for example, who committed very violent crimes when they were fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, and they're not the same person, right, that they were thirty years ago or twenty-five years ago. Um, and yet, 
you know, the question is, okay, what do we do in this situation? We know that the adolescent brain is not as developed as the adult brain. There's no question about that in terms of judgment, decision-making, peer influence, and those kinds of things. And yet we also know, for example, if somebody was killed, you know, when this person's 15, that the victim doesn't have a chance, right, to, to kind of have, they, they don't have the opportunity to have a second chance. And so the question becomes, you know, what is the purpose of our criminal justice system? Do we, you know, do we, if somebody committed a crime at 15 or 16, and now it's 25 years later, 30 years later, and they're not the same person, perhaps they've turned their life around, perhaps they haven't. I mean, I see it all across the board, but people who have kind of turned their life around, do we now say, okay, you deserve a, at least a chance at parole at some point? And, you know, I'm asking that of the two of you. I mean, you might say yes, you might say no, but it's a real issue to think about. Well, do you think that like, because if kids and there's kids doing violent crimes young and things like that, do you think that like serial killers, you're made that way or you're born that way? Like, is it like, do you think that it's something within them the moment they're born or it's life and their family life and life circumstances that makes them into that? I both. think <laughs> there is, yeah, I mean, that, you know, I think that there is almost um, a, a perfect storm that happens mm -hmm. a lot of times to create a serial killer. I think a lot of times there is some genetic predisposition to um, maybe a lack of empathy Mm -hmm. Right or you know some emotional kind of processing deficit, um, uh, maybe a difficult temperament. I think there is a genetic vulnerability oftentimes, um, and then I think that is often combined with some kind of childhood trauma. Mm -hmm. You know, most often you know child abuse, neglect, those kinds of things, and then I think sometimes you might have a head injury thrown in, mm -hmm. you know, right? Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> And, you know, um, and then you have a certain life stressors that oftentimes become the trigger for that person then acting out on often what have been these kind of violent fantasies mm -hmm. that this person has developed in adolescence. And so I think it's just like, it really is, I think, like a perfect storm because you can take any piece of that, I guess, recipe, and you can find thousands of people who had that same experience. You know, you have people who had genetic vulnerabilities. And they didn't become serial killers. Mm -hmm. We know people, we know, we all know people who've had terrible childhood, terrible trauma. And not only did they not become killers, they became more empathic. Yeah. They became advocates, right? They were determined, you know, the buck stops here. Yeah. You know, I am not going to repeat the trauma of my childhood or the multi generational trauma I've experienced. And so obviously, it's not just what you're born with. Obviously, it's not just what happens to you, right? Yeah. So I think it's it's everything. It's it's the genetic predisposition. It's the environmental. I mean, it's a, the upbringing. It is personality traits and temperament. Um, it is you know the life stressors and what happens. I think it's all those things that for you know certain people results in that person becoming a serial killer. What about like the difference in like men and women? Because Nikki and I were kind of talking about that before you joined us. Like there tends to be more men that are classified as serial killers than women. Yes. Well, number one, obviously there are a lot less frequent than male serial killers are, as you've already pointed out. Interesting trivia fact in 1900, about 35% of serial killers were women. Really? And, huh. and today it's between seven and 10%. Why so was it so question, much back then? Well, one theory, you know, we, of course, we don't know for sure, but mm -hmm. one, I think one very viable theory is that what, you know, when you look at motives and you try to break it down according to gender, you know, by far women are more likely to kill for money. Okay. You know, whether it's insurance, inheritance, whatever, or convenience, but money is, is a big motivator. And men also kill for money, of course. We know men who've killed multiple wives for insurance. But um, and so you look in the 1900s and you kind of go, okay, let's compare the economic opportunities for women in 1900 mm -hmm. versus 2022. Um, you know, perhaps a very, very, very small 
obviously, percentage of women, um, because of their own whatever genetic makeup, we already talked about life history, et cetera, and that including lack of economic opportunity, can't own property, right, can't vote, can't get a divorce, mm-hmm. those kinds of things, shows you know, still killing as a way to basically earn a living, right? Because <laughs> oh, they would they would bump off people, you know, for money. And so if you look at it from that perspective, you kind of go, wow, women's rights are really men's rights in that respect, right? <laughs> I mean, you know, that worked out well for men as well. Yeah. Um, and we also know we also know that female social killers are more likely as a group to kill people they know, family members, children, et cetera, et cetera. Wild. Um, yeah, because I was wondering yeah. about that. Like the only case that I I was thinking that I that they don't know, because that's what I was telling Mariah that I was thinking my definition of a serial killer is someone who murders people they don't know because they need to or enjoy it or or this represents somebody that has in their head is a bad person or whatever. But that woman, um keep forgetting your name um the one prostitute that was killing the um her, Eileen Lorna. there you go her clients because that would be someone that she doesn't know and right so that's what I was thinking but I guess Nikki kind of like what I said to you though is you could argue that in her head she was taking care of people that were doing bad things they were picking up prostitutes you know like she wasn't I don't know I guess she wasn't like stalking I guess you could say she was stalking, but she kept getting in their cars. Um, I don't know. Here's the thing. In order to be a serial killer, the definition is really pretty broad. It's murdering somebody, or at least two people, on separate occasions. Okay. That's the definition. If you have murdered somebody at this time and then at another time, then that meets the definition of a serial killer. Really? Um, it used to be, it used to be in 1998, the law was passed that said, that, you know, a serial killer is somebody who murders three or more people with a cooling off period in between. Okay. So what is that cooling? Okay. That, and we didn't know what, what that meant exactly. Like how long of a cooling off period? Nobody knew it exactly. And then in 2005, the FBI had a symposium and said, you know what? We oftentimes get called in on these serial crimes. We want to be able to get called in sooner because we know that the vast majority of people who murder somebody only murder one person. Mm. So when you're talking about somebody who's murdered two different people on two separate occasions, they're kind of in a category by themselves, right? In a very small category. Yeah. And so we want to be able to get called into these cases sooner. So we are going to reduce the number to two. And so there's nothing, although people very commonly think what you said, there's nothing that says the motivation's got to be sexual. There's nothing that says it has to be a stranger. As a matter of fact, some of the scariest serial killers are people who systematically bump off their family members, Mm. you know, one after the other. I mean, that is definitely, I don't know if you're familiar with the Diane Stoudy and Rachel Stoudy um, kind of mother-daughter team. Um, oh man! You know, it, it's just yeah. It, it's a really frightening, frightening uh, story about them. Systematically, they you know they they poison the, the dad slash husband with antifreeze, and then a few months later, they did the same thing to the twenty twenty seven year old son. Oh my and god! Then a few months later, they tried to kill the older daughter, um, and they had planned to kill the eleven or twelve year old sister. Um, and and they were just systematically, and I've always mentioned that case because you can actually go on YouTube and and watch the um, interview tapes with them when they confess, and it is just was killing. it was it money motivation? Were they getting yeah, the life insurance money. policies? I mean, they got um, Diane, who was the mom, got a small amount of insurance, but to hear both of them talk about the reason, like, I mean, so for example. The mom at one point said, Sean, who was the older, was it was his son that was murdered. He yeah, was mildly autistic. Mm. Um, and the mom said, you know, he was just a pet. Oh, he just wouldn't bother. He just would have, he would just kept bothering me. And then when they were talking about Rachel, um, who managed to survive, but is disabled and lives in a sister living will for probably the rest of her life. Um, they said, you know, she had, 
she could finish college and she just, she's got all these loans that she don't loan that are due and she's not trying to get a job. So that, that was, was the reason. reason. Yes. Oh, that's crazy. It was just, it was just, it, it's just mind boggling to listen to these interrogation tapes and just to, it's it just, you can't even get your head around it. So it is important, I think, to realize that, you know, of course, we always talk about, you know, Jeffrey Dahmer and Ted Bundy and John Wayne Gacy and, you know, Aline Warnes is the, is the only female serial killer. It's like, uh, no, <laughs> there, is, there is a lot of women standing behind Aline Warnes, sadly. Um, Why do you think women are, like, Nick, that was another thing Nikki and I were talking about, is why do you think women serial killers aren't as, I don't know, um, infamous, I guess? It's funny. I, I don't think they've been taken as seriously in an odd kind of way. Okay. I think number one, number one, I think they do tend to, to, you know, kill within their family. So people haven't haven't felt as threatened. Yeah, you know, by yeah, them. Yeah. They, don't, they, they don't they don't tend to do as as many bizarre things. You know, in terms of whatever taking sure. trophies, getting people a lot a lot horrible. You know, horrible things that people kind of go, "Oh my God!" You know, did you? Yeah, there's it's missing the yeah, shock they don't, factor, kind of. Exactly. They're missing the shock factor. And I think, like I said, I don't think we've taken them as seriously. When you look at some of the nicknames that, you know, that male soul tells me give like a night stalker, mm-hmm. you know, or BTK or, you know, and then you look at like the giggling grandma. Right. One. I mean, <laughs> you, you know, you're just like, <laughs> like, you're like, what? I mean, this woman like was laughing as she poisoned, you know, multiple family members, and, you know, oh, and, and voice. But it's just like, yeah, it's just kind of strange. And I think because of that, you know, when you look at female killers versus male serial killers, female serial killers tend to have a longer killing time. They tend to fly under the radar a lot longer. Yeah, I was going to say, I feel like they're a little bit more, like, not more controlled. Like, I feel like it's like you said, it's like it's always poisoning. So it's like a slow drip versus like a big you know, um, horrific crime scene. Yeah. 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 I, th- I think that you're right. There's, there's more of a, there's a sneakier way a lot of times of, of doing it. Situation. How long does a case take you? Like when you investigate and you from like start to finish, how long does that take? Like a, a week, couple weeks? Oh gosh. You know, it does. It, it depends upon what the question is. Like when I'm doing an evaluation of um, a juvenile offender who's now, you know, in their 40s. Mm-hmm. It may take me a few months because I'm going through 25 years of records. Um, I mean, I'm talking to multiple sources. I'm looking at police reports. Um, and then if I'm doing, um, you know, for example, an NGI, somebody who's been found not guilty by reason of sanity, they have recommitment hearings, mm. right? Where so every couple of years, then, you know, there's a reevaluation to see has this person made progress? Are they still a danger? I mean, that may take a couple of weeks. So it just varies um, depending on what the question is. Do you ever get the families of either like the victims or even the the person who's who you're dealing with family try to talk to you and intervene or do they have no clue who you are? Well, when I'm doing evaluations of offenders, um, I oftentimes talk to family members to try to get their perspective on what happened and mm-hmm. then, you know, how they see that their loved person is changing or not changing, right? You know, over, and that's just one piece of the puzzle in terms of the evaluation. Um, when I first was out of school, I worked a lot with victims and I looked, I worked a lot with um, family members of victims because most of the victims I was working with were children. Mm-hmm. And so a lot of times the families would be court ordered to treatment because there had been some kind of abuse. Mm -hmm. And there was, you know, I was working in a therapy setting to see if this family could be reunited Mm -hmm. um, or or not. Or if the rights need to be terminated. And that was, oh, that was such a heartbreaking work. Yeah. Um, Very, so rewarding, but so, you know, so heartbreaking to see just to see the impacts of trauma on children. Um, and, you know, because I was seeing them, a lot of times the trauma had been relatively recent. Yeah. And so that that was pretty heartbreaking. Um, yeah, it's hard to wrap work. your brain around it because I, I was 
brought up in, I, I would consider normal. I mean, not everybody's life is normal, but like just I'm nothing crazy happened in my life, you know, growing up, which I was very fortunate, thank God. And then I hear these stories of things of just things that the, how the world is and how people and other families are. And it just blows my mind. It just, it's so insane to me how families could be like that. And it would be hard to work with. I think I would cry <laughs> all the time. I couldn't do oh, it. I, 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 let me tell you, I did on many occasions. Yeah. I, I mean, I remember getting him. I can remember definitely getting in my car and just, you know, after a day and just kind of, you know, letting loose and, um, you know, one of the things I did learn, you were talking about, you know, things in your family, and we all have this framework. One of the things I learned quickly, um, not only in terms of working with victims and children, but also when I started working with offenders is, you know, so I had to ask very specific questions. Like, you know, did this ever happen to you? Did this ever happen to you? Because I would sometimes, when I first started, kind of go, were you ever abused as a child? No. Mm. No. How would you How would you describe your family? Normal is normal. And then you start asking questions. And you know, yeah, my dad would go away for, you know, my mom and dad would go out for a few days or they'd be gone for a week or two. Well, how old were you? Five. You know, mm, you're left yeah. by yourself for that time. Yeah. And it's like, there's just, there was just no sense. I was like, this is not what? normal. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. like, like, I'm a mom of four kids. I mean, if you have a hard time late playing my college kids, I by themselves <laughs> when they come home. Literally. <laughs> you know, like, yes. Oh, another issue. Yes. <laughs> you know, but, um, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, to think about, to think about a five year old taking care of a three year old for a week is just horrifying. Right? I don't but, think my kids could do it for an hour. I think they would be I like know. lost. <laughs> It just, I, and I couldn't even do it thinking about just like go and live in my life and, oh yeah, I got to go back home. So I've been gone for a couple of days, you know, like that's just so crazy yeah. to me. Yeah. <sighs> it, it's also so complicated because, you know, we all want to blame somebody, you know, it's yeah. because it's so painful. And so I, we all look people to blame and, and there, there, there is accountability and responsibility all across the board, but one of the things I did see so often when I was working with victims, especially, it's just the multi-generational totally. part of it. The other thing that I was curious about that I wanted to get your opinion on is like the current, I, don't, I guess it's always kind of been there, but the fascination with serial killers and why do you feel like so many people are so interested in them? I have been asked that question so many times. Um, no, and I'm just, I, because I, I think we're all curious about that and I can yeah. tell you kind of the common theories, but I, I don't think we know. I mean, I think for some people, um, it's almost like true crime is like real life, scary stories. You know what I mean? Like, sure. so pe people who, pe people who like horror movies, people like scary movies, um, psychological thrillers, it's like true crime is in some respects, and I don't mean that lightly because. I yeah. think when we watch scary movies, we get this kind of relief. It's like there's a safe environment for us to be scared and get an adrenaline rush and all that, but we know that we're safe, you know? And I think yeah. there's part of that. I think, I think the stories are interesting. I think there is um, information. I think there's safety information sometimes. I think there's some kind of like, there's some thought of like the devil, you know, right? is better than the devil you don't. So if I am learning, if I am, um, you know, watching these stories, if, I mean, because you definitely see patterns, right? You see definitely see patterns of behavior, you see red flags, you know, then maybe I, this can keep me from becoming a victim. Um, I think maybe it's all of that. Um, I've heard people say, you know, I've always been an empath. Sometimes I feel trapped almost by my empathy. And so I've always been fascinated by people who just don't seem to have any. They just do whatever they want to do. It's like a different species of people. I've heard people say that. So I think yeah. it's different for everybody. I think there's some commonalities probably that encompass all of those. Um, but I think when it comes down to it, it's just a personal fascination. It's like being interested in, you know, psychology to some extent, you know, how the mind works. Mm -hmm. And then how mm -hmm. does the mind get off track? And, yeah. you know, and why do people do the things they do? I mean, I think there's a curiosity that a lot of us have. So I wish I could say, okay, it's this. You know, I know in my family, I was, you know, my mom was a true crime buff before, 
you know, it was Vogue, you know, it was, it was kind of, you know, she watched every, you know, I don't know where they were, Mannix, Hawaii Five O. I can't remember what all the shows, Ironside or something like that. Um, and she, she was obsessed, you know, with watching those shows. Um, so I know that I got that kind of naturally in a way. I was definitely a true crime, a, you know, fan in a way before I became a forensic psychologist. Um, but to say it's these three things, I don't know. Is this something you always wanted to do was be a psychologist or specifically a forensic one, or you just kind of fell into it? I always, I thought I wanted to be a psychologist for a long period of time. Um, I have a um, middle illness in my family. And so that was always something that was interesting to me, trying to understand that. And then when I was 14 on a family vacation, I read the book Helter Skelter about Charles Manson and his family. And that really got the ball rolling, um, you know, in terms of, so I think I was already a little bit of a true crime buff. And then when, when I read that, I just, I don't know what it was. I just could not understand what happened. Like why, you know, why does this happen? Why does this happen? And then I think what, was really the nail in the coffin in terms of me moving into forensic um, was I, when I was a senior in high school, Ted Bundy escaped from um, the jail in Colorado, made his way to Florida State, which is about 70 miles from my home, and broke into the Chi Omega sorority house and wreaked complete habit and did horrible things. And, you know, I remember seeing pictures of his victims. And thinking that could have been me you know it was like it just made it so close to home and so I think that really pushed me even more in forensic psychologists and then in forensic psychology and then the last thing I'll say is as a senior in college um, I went to summer school and we had a small class and I literally pitched a fit um, to talk our professor into taking us to maximum security prison and talking to some of the inmates there wow and and that was it that was it. I mean, it was like, I am headed down that path. Yeah. It sounds like you, it kind of just worked out, you know, like it just kind of headed into that's what you needed to do. I, you know, I've said this many times. I, I feel so lucky um, in terms of I love what I do. I really do. I enjoy it. I, it's fulfilling to me. It's interesting to me. Um, you know, forensic psychology allows you to do so many different things. Um, so I'm somebody who likes to wear a lot of different hats. Yeah. And this really allows me to do that. So yeah, I really feel very lucky to do what I do. Let's do some of our fun questions with her. Get to, get to know her a little bit. Oh, yeah. We always kind of ask these oh. like random silly questions. Um, just to kind of get to know you. Um, I have a one. Uh, what is something you hoard? Mm, I definitely hoard books. Okay. For sure. I mean, way, I mean, I've got way too many books that I read. I'm trying to think if there's anything else I hoard. Muffins. Oh, really? I have this special <laughs> brand of muffins that I love. Okay. And yes. I cannot go to the grocery store without buying more. Okay. <laughs> now, are they pre made so. ones or like ones yeah, that you have? Yeah. the brand. And now you have to oh, share. No. Yeah, it's called Zen Bakery. Um, and you're okay. here in California. I love them. They're raspberry oat bran. Mm, they're so good. Really? Well, actually, raspberry, blueberry. Oat. Yes, I eat one every day. My husband teases me. He's like, <laughs> What, like what is going on like do you think there's going to be some kind of apocalypse <laughs> yeah <laughs> they might get <laughs> discontinued if we have one i am stocked with muffins <laughs> that's funny they might get discontinued and then you might just you know you have to just get as much as you can kind of like when exactly yeah you got to like when twinkies <laughs> and ding dongs when they like got rid of those i was my mom loved um ding dongs and she was flipping out because they were getting rid of ding dongs. I'm like, Oh God, we need to stock up. And I remember we were on a hunt because she was panicking on how is she ever <laughs> going to get a ding dong again? <laughs> but now that they're back. <laughs> um, what are some of your hobby? Like what's, what's your favorite hobby? Mm, 
I do love to exercise, and that's a genuine. I go to the gym every day. Oh, wow. Um, it's as much for mental health the reason I do. And then we, my husband and I, love to foster dogs. We've oh. fostered 65 so far. Oh, my God. And counting, yeah. So we, we really enjoy that. That's oh. a super fun thing. I um, love that. What a uh, Oh, we've been so lucky. We have such. We have had such amazing. It's just it's incredible to see the cosmos match these dogs with their families. It's just it's just such a joy um, to see that. Oh, I love that hobby. That's a great hobby. Oh, well, thank you. Yeah, it's it is really fun. We would encourage anybody um, just to give it a try because people a lot of times think that like, I could never do that. I could never do that, and it's like yeah. You could, though. You really could. Anybody could. When you're on an airplane, are you a window or an aisle? 100% aisle. Really? (laughs) I want to know why. Why the aisle? Um, oh my God! I, I'm, I'm really like true. Con- I feel like I'm on some kind of true confession <laughs> show. Like, truth or dare? So. It started when I was pregnant with my oldest son, and I had to go to the bathroom like 500 yeah, times yeah. an hour. And so I would warn the person, you know, I would just tell the person, if I got it, like a window seat, look, I'm happy to sit here. I'm just going to tell you, your flight is going to be long <laughs> and active. <laughs> Very interactive. I'm going to yeah. be climbing over you. <laughs> exactly. And I just, I don't know. It just became almost like a little bit of a claustrophobic thing, you know, right. when I was pregnant. Yeah. And that has been many years ago, many years ago. And I still, I mean, not that I can't, I can sit in the middle. I can sit by the window. I'm not going to freak out if I get, you know, either one of those. But if I have a chance, I am in that aisle every time. Okay. Well, thank you, Joni, for so much. I feel like we need to have you back because we didn't even talk about your podcast or your book. I actually just ordered your book. Um, so I'll get back to you about it because I can't wait to read it. Um, so I feel like it's so hard. We need so much more time with you. Well, I would, I would love it. Anytime, just let me know and we'll do it again. Thank you so it much. Was, it was super fun. Awesome. Thanks. Have a good weekend. You too. Thanks. You too. Okay, we didn't really talk about how she keeps her personal bias out of it, but like, I know. How does she deal with everyday life? Like, you've spent all day talking to these people who are like criminally insane. Oh, I'd be sleeping with one eye open next to my husband because I'd be like, mm, too many of you guys are unpredictable. Well, no, her job is intense. It's legal. It's, it's more, did this person fully understand the consequences of their actions? Were they coherent enough to understand what they were doing in that moment? And yeah, I don't think I could handle that job because first of all, if I was, if we were sitting on a beach and you're telling me that there's a sailboat and there's no sailboat, I'd be like, listen, dude. There is no freaking sailboat. Like, I don't think my patience level could handle that. I'd be like, dude, there's no sailboat. Quit staring at no sailboat. And then if you were literally telling me that there is a sailboat and that you think it's in your head, I don't think I could handle it. It would drive me insane. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It would be awful. I mean, it would just be this like constant, I feel like exhaustion, right? Of like, like she said, like she was trying to tell the schizophrenic, like, I don't hear anything. That, what? You know, like, it, what's what the saying? You can't. Um, Ration with a crazy person. Yeah, there's like a little flip saying for that. I don't know what it is. Ryan always tells me that, like, he's like, it blows my mind that it always blows your mind when someone's crazy. Like, he's like, I don't think you get that people are nuts. And I truly don't. I can't handle it. Yeah, I guess people do shock the hell out of you, right? Like you're like, I really didn't see that coming. And even if I did see it coming, he says that I have Disney. I have like, um, like I think my life is a <laughs> Disney movie because like everybody's la 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 and this is the way it's supposed to be. And then when someone comes in that's a nut, it like rocks my world. See, I'm not like that because I'm like skeptical of people. And I always think people have like ulterior motives. 
which is not a great way to like look at people, but I'm always kind of like, mm. okay. I mean, I guess in this job, it's like, how often is she shocked? I mean, there's another good question. Like how, how many times are you like rocked to your core or it just doesn't shock you anymore? I feel like we need to bring her back because we really sweet little Joni. We didn't talk about any of her stuff. Like she has a book that I did order on Amazon. So I'm really excited to read it. She has a podcast. I, I, I feel like we just like barely scratched the surface with her. Yeah, I feel like I feel like we need a part two. Yeah, I agree. I, I'm going to send her a note because I feel like we barely clipped the surface there. Um, and I feel like there's a lot more she could talk to us about. So submit your questions. If you have questions for Dr. Joni Johnston, send them in so that we can um, ask them. Yeah, I'm sure everybody that's listening is like, I cannot believe you didn't ask this. What about that? What about this? So send them to us. All right. Well, that was fun. Let's keep the ball rolling. We're on a good roll. All right. Okay. I'll talk to you later. Bye. Okay. Talk to you later. Thank you so much for listening and supporting us. We do encourage you to follow us at Instagram at Body to Burial. Hit us up on Twitter at Body to Burial. And you guessed it, you can send us an email to hello at body to burial.com. If you have any guest suggestions, just let us know. Please hit the subscribe button or follow button on whatever app you are listening to. Thanks so much, guys. See you next time. <laughs>